Good afternoon, everyone. Bon après-midi, tout le monde. Uh, what a pleasure it is to be here today to moderate the final panel of the Toronto Global Forum. This is actually my first time moderating a panel. And I, I have to say I'm a little bit nervous about keeping the time, so I was very happy to know that I was going to get a nice big clock, but I'll do my best to keep us on time. I know this is a topic that is of great interest to all of you here, and I know that the panelists are very passionate about it, just as I am, and so I know that we're going to have a very lively discussion. So I'm joined on stage today by people I think many of you already know well. To my right, to my direct left, is Richard Kempler, and Richard is the executive director of La Fédération des gens d'affaires francophones de l'Ontario, la FGA. Next is Régis Michaud. He's the founding president of RM Recruitment International. And finally, Guillaume Racheline, vice president of finance for Walmart Canada. So I think after three days of lively and stimulating discussions on innovation and resilience in our economy, especially in the current unstable environment. Um, I'm delighted that today we have a chance to talk about a, a topic that is dear to my heart, uh, la francophonie. It's, I think, a new element. If it hasn't already been, par been part of your business development toolbox, I hope it's something that you will consider because it really, truly is une vraie richesse. It's a true uh, richness and a strength in our economy, and I know in economies around the world. Uh, so I'll just, briefly before I open it up for discussions, Ontario launched its first Francophone economic development strategy back uh, unofficially in 2019. We recognize that we have the largest Francophone population outside of Quebec, right here in Ontario. And our francophonie is scattered all around the province, um, in Toronto, in Eastern Ontario, Northern Ontario. And we had francophones and bilingual Ontarians doing business. And as I traveled the province as Minister of Francophone Affairs, I learned about a lot of the challenges that they faced as they were trying to grow their businesses or trade with other areas of the province or other provinces in Canada. And so, uh, our government decided to, to look at how we could bring these francophone business people and entrepreneurs together. And that's how we ended up creating La Fédération des gens d'affaires francophones de l'Ontario that Richard is the head of. And I'm very pleased to note that last year, in uh, the end of the year, I attended Le Sommet International de la Francophonie in Gerba in Tunisia. And I was uh, told about the, the Alliance des Patronats Francophones. So the international organization created uh, an organization bringing together all of the different French Francophone chambers of commerce. And I'm very proud of, to, to say that Ontario created its FGA six months ahead of l'Organisation Internationale de la Francophonie. And the reason we created it is because of the topic that we're here to discuss today the real value that uh, an economy, a jurisdiction, a country can derive from leveraging its talent, its bilingual talent. And we have so much here in Ontario. Uh, so this is something that I've had a keen interest in since the beginning. And I'll just give you a couple of statistics. Um, our francophone and bilingual um, members of our economy generate $80 billion to our GDP. Um, that is a tremendous amount of value and there's still so much that is untapped. And so with that in mind, I want to learn from our panelists today about how we can do even more to leverage our francophone and our bilingual talent. So I will now turn it to each one of my members, of my panelists here to introduce themselves a little bit. And I will turn to Richard first. And the first theme of our panel is the benefits and competitive edge to bilingualism. So how can businesses and organizations and jurisdictions gain a competitive edge by leveraging their bilingual talent? And are there any industries that you think you could highlight that bilingualism presents a unique opportunity for? 
Thank you, Minister, and thank you so much for enabling the incorporation of the AFGA. We're so proud of this. Um, uh, I'm Richard Kampler, Executive Director of the AFGA. As Minister Mulroney correctly pointed out, we've been created in January 2021. Um, and when we established FGA, we didn't even know what the Francophone ecosystem was in Ontario. Two years down the road, we could say that there are over 30,000 Francophone businesses in Ontario. Uh, the GDP, as you said, our contribution, if you add a Francophone and bilingual, is um, $80 billion per annum to be reckoned with. And, and um, just to, to add a little bit to what you say, um, although Francophone and, and bilingual people in Ontario account for 10.1% of the population, they account for over 11% of the GDP. So Francophones in any organization tend to be more productive than unilingual people. Um, it's it's interesting to 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 notice, but it also helped us. Uh, the minister mentioned the APF, so the Alliance des Patrons Francophones, uh, which comprises 28 countries, uh, 29 representatives, because Canada is the only jurisdiction represented by two bodies, so CPF, uh, CPQ in Quebec and FGA in Ontario. And um, I must say that during the OIF summit last year, people were flabbergasted to know that outside of Quebec, there is a huge population uh, which speaks French and hence could welcome them should the companies from the international Francophonie wish to establish a beachhead in North America. I'll leave it at this for the time being, but uh, in a nutshell, being Francophone helps you grow your business in both official languages. Regis? Hi to all, thanks for having me. My name is Regis Michaud. I've been in HR for uh, almost 15 years now, but I uh, don't know if you heard about it, but uh, it's kind of a hot topic for a few years or uh, a lot of years, but the shortage of manpower in the province of Quebec is huge. So five years ago, I decided to start my own international recruitment business, and I've been dealing with bilinguals in the province of Quebec uh, more, most of the time, for sure. But uh, we've been recruiting Filipino workers for five years now. And uh, when we first started, I, did, I didn't realize that uh, so few people were speaking in English in Quebec. So I know we're here to speak about the French language, but I think it's comparable. And what we realize is when we bring spe English speaking people, so the Filipino worker, Hans, they coming in and the manager position, the director, the CEO want to learn English so they can communicate with the worker. It gives them a huge advantage to be able to export, to, able, to be able to work with more subsidiary. And it's been huge for five years now, but the other thing we realize is once you bring those worker, if they don't learn French, they will leave. So it's going to be the same thing here. It's going to be the same thing all over Canada. So we, we've got now about 20, 25 full-time French teacher, and we began the French teaching lesson prior to coming in. And that's exactly what we want to do. So it's going to be important for the manager to learn French. It's going to be important for the CEO to learn French also. But uh, I think the edge that it will give them it's of course the pool of labor the uh, the pool of labor the french labor is amazing they have talent they have knowledge they have the education they have everything to help so we have to open the door to that and to to create that we have to uh, create an ecosystem to welcome them merci guillaume um, dear Minister, thank you very much for the introduction, and I'm extremely glad to uh, to be here. Um, I would say for me, it is this topic has also a bit of a personal touch. So I, was, you know, I'm born and raised in France. I'm a proud French citizen, but I'm also a proud Canadian citizen by adoption. I live in Toronto, um, and my wife's from Montreal. So it has something very personal uh, about this topic. And outside of that, um, even though I'm not going to speak on behalf of my company. I work for Walmart, who is, uh, as you may know, a large company that operates in Canada throughout all provinces, and both in French and in English. And maybe that's a bit of the lens that I will try to provide as well, which is what I've been observing on the, on the business front. And if I think about this topic, why, in my opinion, it is such a critical topic that can drive competitive advantage, it's actually for two main reasons. The first one is very... 
tactical and transactional. Like retail is all about the customers that are shopping in retail and at Walmart. And you know, you said it, whether it's in Ontario, in Quebec, in New Brunswick, in other provinces, Canadians are inherently bilingual. I think it's 18% statistic Canada said, but it varies pretty much across provinces and across different locations and communities within the provinces. So ability to be able to address the needs of our customers, however they want to shop with us in both language is actually critical and a necessary um, competitive edge if we want to be successful. So, you know, retail is a matter of game of inch, every transaction, every day, and being able to excel and that front is critical. That's the first one. The second one is a bit maybe more strategic, which is being able to address both cultures, language, can also give some sense of um, cultural relation and ability to step back and understand the big picture, strategic analysis that I'll be happy to address a bit later on during the, the panel. So uh, looking forward to it. Thank you. Well, um, to build on that, I, you know, one of the motivations to uh, bring together our, our francophone and bilingual community was to highlight how large it is. You know, we have over 650,000 people in Ontario who speak French, who are Franco-Ontarians, and over one and a half million people who speak both languages. And that is a true asset. And to build on Guillaume's point, there are maybe some cultural, um, there's maybe a cultural openness to working with other bilingual cultures. Um, and I think it also opens up tremendous opportunities to look pl in places where a bilingual, a non-bilingual workforce would not look to do business with. So well, there's other jurisdictions that are bilingual that speak French that give an opportunity for trade and then also internationally. And that's one of the things that we, I know we're trying to highlight. But when you're trying to attract a bilingual workforce, and this is your, your bread and butter, and, and I think it's really insightful for all of us to hear about your experience in Quebec trying to attract Anglophone workers and, and the, the, you know, the work that you're doing to do that. Are there specific industries that you're focused on? And are there uh, certain strategies that you've seen um, organizations employ that are more or less successful? I don't see that as a specific industry because the needs are everywhere. So I, when we first started, to be honest, what we thought is we would bring worker and they would acclimate and they would just fit in the company and they would just stay here forever. So it was a mistake for sure. And what we realized is one of the edge that we didn't talk prior to it is the creativity that the immigrant can bring also. So. But one of the problems is once they're here, we want them to work the 50, 60 hours a week. It's really hard. So if you want to attract them, you have to take care of everything underneath, meaning that once they come here, you have to be ready to welcome the family also. You have to have the infrastructure for the kids to go to French school if they want it. If you, the second generation will be the one keeping the language alive. So. You have to have the housing market ready to welcome them also. The, you can't bring them and just expect them to be able to do everything by themselves. So they have to be able to rely on someone. So if you want to attract them, you really have to have everything on place. So meaning that inside the company, they have someone that they can rely on. They, uh, they can have people outside of the job so they can accommodate to the uh, town, to the environment around them, but mostly be ready to welcome the family also and take care of the family. It's just not the worker. Give them time to learn the language also, because if you want to bring French people, what we do in Quebec is we bring English people, but we learn them French. I think it's going to be the same if you want them to acclim acclimate to the environment, but uh, that would be about it. Guillaume, I wonder if within Walmart or in other, other experiences you've had, there are certain strategies that you have found that work well within organizations or any other comments you wanna make on how to attract a bilingual workforce? Yeah, I think it's such a, I mean, it's, it's a tricky one, right? Because we, we, it's not a, something that is easy for us to address. So we, are, we operate nationally as a retailer 
our headquarters is in Mississauga, though we've got operation across the country. So definitely it's something we're looking for, but it's really hard to find, to your point, hard to attract. What I've noticed, my personal experience is, um, there's a bit of a snowball effect. I'm gonna state a bit the obvious, but when you have people that are able actually to operate in both you know, language and that are showing how they can create the value within an organization by opening both, um, it actually attracts new talent by itself. So um, it's a bit of an ingrown benefit, but it's true that when we try to hire people on the market, it has been ex exceptionally difficult and, um, and something very rare. So I would welcome any uh, good hint in the future to be able to attract more. Richard, um, I was wondering if you could comment perhaps on collaboration with educational institutions or governments, for instance, um, on, on things that you've seen have been productive in um, this area. This is paramount. Um, everybody is in agreement with the fact that we need to attract uh, foreign manpower because two thirds of the population growth in terms of francophones derive from uh, immigration. Two thirds of the immigration comes from um, um, South, um, from Africa, West Africa, basically. Um, if, as Regis correctly pointed out, if you want to attract uh, skilled manpower, you have to attract the entire family. They have to feel home. You have to uh, to uh, um, welcome them. We we'll always say that Canada is a very welcoming country. Um, you uh, you attract newcomers by greeting them as friend. When you welcome them as uh, francophones, it has to be like family. You have to give them the keys to the house, but they have to have a support system. The good thing here in Ontario and what the government does is nobody is, a, not everybody is aware of the fact that you could be serviced in both official languages uh, at every uh, stage of the Ontario government. We have to have a support system. We have to have schools. We have to have schools from kindergarten to uh, post-secondary post education. You've been instrumental in creating Université de l'Ontario Français. So UF is one of the good examples where you have first class education, which builds a bridge to the, to, to, to the, uh, to the business community because oh, when these people will be the first one employed in a francophone hence bilingual system. So these are examples, true examples, concrete examples of how you attract and retain francophone businesses is welcome the entire family, give them all the services they need in French, being able to choose where they want to be served in French or in English, and give them a good quality education, which will in turn give them better jobs, access to better jobs. Yeah, I was just gonna add something. You know, I, I think inherently, and I'm gonna speak for businesses, if there is true value in how we operate to be able to operate both in, in both languages, just doubling down on why is it something critical for the business and how we can drive a competitive advantage as a business is in itself a way to attract talent. Because then they're not coming just for the sake of them being able to operate in both languages. They're coming for a specific reason, which is to drive incremental value. So I think it's just spending the extra amount of down, time sorry, to understand what inherently from a business model standpoint can be leveraged in both language is actually critical. For us in retail, it's a bit more obvious because again, headquarters in Toronto, operation across the country in many, in many uh, languages, you would definitely do bridges of local and global at the same time, and that drives competitive advantage. So when we welcome some people, even internationally, Belgium, we've done it, France, Quebec, they feel that they're contributing and adding value directly by being able to operate both locally and globally. And that's exactly the, the one of the impetus for our, our Francophone economic development strategies. There's so many large national companies that have their headquarters here who need their workforce to be able to operate in both languages, just not just domestically, but internationally as well. And making sure that uh, the Ontario government is aware of that and doing everything that we can to strengthen that ecosystem that all our panelists are talking about is important. Making sure that people who come and speak French but are bilingual workers know that they can educate their, their children from that petite enfance all the way to post-secondary. Make sure that those services are there, that they know that when they access government services in our 28 
de designated regions that they can access those services in both languages. There's a lot more to do, but making sure that people are aware of that bilingual ecosystem, I think is key to attracting those people who want to keep their maternal language alive. And then I will also wear another hat. Um, it's new to me, but it's president of the Treasury Board. And as president of the Treasury Board, I'm partly responsible for working with the Ontario Public Service, the thousands of people who, uh, who work for the Ontario government. And one of the challenges that we have is trying to make sure that we have enough people to, to serve people in both languages. And we've been trying to figure out the best way uh, to, to ensure that we are attracting bilingual workers. And one of the things is, making sure that we advertise all positions in English and French. Because, you know, you may have gone to school through high school in French, and therefore you are a fluent speaker, but you have may not have been living in French or working in French for a number of years, and you might think that you've lost it, or you don't have the technical terminology you believe is necessary to operate at a high level. So making sure that people who identify as bilingual but may not do so in a professional sense are invited to consider all jobs and then once they we think we need to survey them so that we know that those language skills are there then support them as they need additional training so that they feel confident and competent in delivering services in both languages and so having those kinds of um, resources available to the workforce i think just on a very basic level is, is important to continue to attract and develop a bilingual workforce. So in terms of on that theme, and this is something that Richard is very involved in, in terms of how we leverage our bilingualism further. When we set out to start La FGA, um, you know, we didn't know exactly how large our francophone or our bilingual economy was. Uh, and so what we had to do was measure it. And that was Richard's uh, first task. Uh, so can you speak to how you did that and in terms of how you eventually managed to value to to measure the actual value of the bilingual workforce to the Ontario economy in terms of productivity and innovation and any other metrics that you consider? Yes, um, absolutely. Uh, um, as you correctly pointed out, we didn't know what the Francophone economy looked like in Ontario. Um, now we know there are about 30,150 um, um, corporations, Francophone, uh, majority held and managed by francophones. Um, of course, 95% um, of those companies are SMEs. Uh, some of them are very, very small companies. And the importance, and this is what the feedback we got from the field, uh, although we're a very young organization, we have uh, about 60 direct members, Chamber of Commerce, uh, Crown corporations, um, private companies who have federal competence, and also lots of SMEs. But through our association members, chambers of commerce, and so on, we represent over 5,000 of those companies. So, so we we have actually a survey from the ground up. So we know um, that uh, we are uh, uh, specifically uh, strong in three factor in three sectors: um, agribusiness and forestry. Uh, mining engineering and construction. And the third one is technical uh, and professional services. Uh, in all those fields, we need to, to have more people, you know, more than I do, that there are over 300,000 um, job positions unfilled uh, for, for time being in Ontario. If you add the uh, francophone lens to it, it's even worse as far as we're concerned. We're lacking uh, francophone, hence bilingual uh, manpower in all sectors. I agree with Regis. I mean, it's cross board, it's not one sector in particular. Um, what we've been doing, we've been helping um, what we saw were the the most dire needs in terms of, of helping our uh, francophone business community grow. Like we had a workshop for women entrepreneurs uh, which from day one. I mean, we were we were incorporated in January 2021. As already of the first quarter of 2021, we had our first sessions, first as webinars and then in-person sessions. It is paramount, it is it is of utmost importance to, to help businesses grow. Uh, as I mentioned, francophone businesses are, tend to be smaller in size than, than, than non-francophone businesses in Ontario, adding to the fact that most of them are held by uh, newcomers. So if you're speaking about a minority uh, from a language standpoint, uh, a visible minority, and, and uh, if and 
half of the new businesses are, are, are created by women. So if you add all these things, it's very, very difficult to get financing. So one of the tasks we, we've been doing with FGA is to have the concierge service. So we say, this is the piece of advice we could give you. Should you incorporate? Where could you find some grants? Where could you find some money? Where could you find some education, continuing education. We, we've launched uh, Incubo, for instance, uh, w which which is a platform where you have everything with relates to startup, from ideation to scaling up, everything which is available in French in Ontario, either free or paying, my, I mean, from the user standpoint, so it's very user friendly. I'm a newcomer. I'm over 50. I'm a woman. I live in Sudbury. I would like to launch a fintech. Where should I go? Which programs, which services are available to me? So we have to give our workforce, our uh, our um, community in general, and our business leaders all the tools in French, so they could they could grow and and thrive. In, in the bilingual environment. Do you find that being um, bilingual in a, in a kind of in a minority situation drives more innovation? It does. It does. De facto, it does because you have to be more flexible. You have to be more agile. Uh, when, when you understand both ecosystems, you're very flexible. You could, could go from English to French back and forth, but also understand third languages, other languages, because you're used to this flexibility, to this intellectual gymnastics, whereby you, you could adapt and see what gives. And the, the simple fact that you are a minority, you have to be more, more reactive and proactive. And, and one more thing, if I may add, it's not only that, um, somebody here I met earlier on uh, during the, this, um, this forum told me something very interesting. He is Ontario-based. He has a, um, a company which operates in three languages, English, French, and Spanish. And from experience, this gentleman told me that the Francophones did tend to be more faithful and loyal as customers on a long on a long term basis. That's very interesting because when you're in a minority setting, you want to help one another. And this is one also uh, one of the strengths that we have as a minority community. In my time in my role as Minister of Francophone Affairs, working on the economic development file, I found that it's also encouraged a more global um, a perspective um, and outreach. So I wonder, Regis, if you um, have had any, if you can share any examples that you've noticed in your work of how having um, a bilingual workforce can facilitate any kind of international partnership or business expansion as companies are looking to grow, how does bilingualism influence that or shape that in any way? Yeah, we have company in Quebec and uh, what we realize at first is we didn't ask for the direction of the manager to adapt and learn English and speak about the culture, about the worker when they're coming in. And you, we ask the immigrant to learn everything outside of the job, outside of the hour of the job. And a company that have done exchange and scrum meeting and that just spent one hour a week with all their worker and exchanging about the problem that we, they face in the company and all the solution, all the creativity, all the originality that come from the worker and the way they were doing the job back in their country, it evolves a lot. And I would say that probably 15% of our company, the manager were not speaking English when they first began the recruitment process, but decided to take English lesson on our side, but uh, decided to take the lesson they said to, to learn and when the, the worker are coming in, the important part is to continuously check in with them, continuously check in how they are doing, how they can evolve, how they can help. And uh, But we've seen business going, uh, being able to do business in the U.S., but uh, the owner was not speaking a word of English prior to their worker coming. And so it's so, so great to see how they can evolve successfully with those workers. Guillaume, I wonder, I mean, Walmart is a multinational company, um, and so it has a very, very uh, multilingual workforce. But in terms of the bilingual one, are there um, any 
examples that you can share, the same question as I asked Regis of uh, things that have, where bilingualism has helped from a business expansion uh, perspective. And also, I wonder if there are any case studies, best practices that you've noticed that Walmart has developed that other companies could learn from. Thanks for the question, not an easy one. So I, I'm gonna speak um, mainly from what I've observed, less from the company, but what I've observed is um, it's, it's really a matter of details and a company being able to walk the talk on this topic. Without addressing necessarily the statistic differences, the fact that there's a minority and a majority, let's leave that aside. As soon as you're a retailer and you're saying, I want to win, compete in communities where English and French are important, then it's everyone's game. So to give you, like the best example is, we offer training for all our um, hourly associates in French and English. When we've got leadership meetings at the company, they're all translated live in both languages. When there is um, management promotion, department managers, store managers, we've done this both in French and in English. Um, and it even goes where we just launched actually a university program where we are paying for tuition and books where people can that are English native can learn French as a second language with Berlitz and the opposite as well being true. So, so I think you need to be all in. And even when you're in the headquarters here in Mississauga and you have a leadership meeting across the country where for sure there's a minority, it is actually quite important, which is what we're doing, to have both things happening. That opens mind, open perspective. It helps people then to increase internal movement within the company where we're seeing people that are more French speakers that are learning the English and then be able to move from different provinces, different communities. Um, so I do think there is tactics that need to be done, but it's a, it's a very, in my view, I've observed that it works the best when it's all in. You can be half-half on this topic because as soon as you're only doing bits and pieces in some places where you feel you would get the most benefit, then you're not doing it entirely. So, um, so to me, that, that has been the, the biggest learning um, of what I've been observing in the last few years. And I, I, don't, I don't know if you're as well versed in the history of Walmart Canada. I'm, I'm not. But as Walmart entered Canada and it had to learn that being bilingual was part of how to do business here successfully, are you aware of any best practices that Walmart experienced from other parts of its business that inspired it in terms of how to how to win that? How to win over that clientele, and and also that this is part of doing business. You have to have your your you have to be able to train your workforce in French. They have to be ready to greet people in both languages. You have to have your uh, your your labels translated. All, all of that. Was there anything um, from that perspective that you you can share with us? Um, I, I think what what happened. If you look at our history, we're going to celebrate 30 years next year. Um, in Quebec right now, we've got around 70 stores and we've grown consistently either through acquisition or through opening new stores. Um, definitely, there's a sense of if you grow in Quebec, if you're in New Brunswick, if you're in northern Ontario, if you're near Ottawa and even in other provinces and we have stores there, you quickly understand that bilingualism is not a transactional thing, right? There is there's communities, there is engagement through how could we collectively offer the right level of services being local services, to which we partner with a lot of suppliers that are local in each of our stores. But you need that ability to be able to understand the, I would say the finesse of each communities that makes actually, in my view, retail um, something that is core and key to everyone's day to day. So definitely what we've learned over time is you know, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach where you're coming and you're saying every store is going to be alike and you're going to basically have the same approach, business approach throughout Canada. We're a very diverse country and bilingualism is also, for me, a representation of that diversity. It brings a lot of value to be able to um, address it very differently across 
each of our communities. So there's a lot of work to be able to be local on the one hand with our suppliers, but at the same time, keeping our scale in order to drive efficiencies and, and low prices. Thank you. Well, Walmart's experience is so different from a lot of the small to medium-sized companies that um, I had the I've had the chance to meet with and that LiveGia really represents. And I, I think that uh, a company like Walmart that brings all of its weight and its experience can uh, establish itself well and conduct business in both languages easily and certainly more easily than some smaller businesses that are challenged by all sorts of things that you may not think of, like licensing exams in certain areas for their workers may only be in English. Um, and so I, my, I, when, I, when I'm reflecting on this, because that's the smaller ones need more government help and support. And that's why we've been so active in this way, because we want to make sure that we're helping those businesses grow and thrive because they make such significant impacts in their communities. Um, and so that's a lot of the work that we've been doing. And I think to the future, you know, I hope that La FGA will continue to grow and bring together um, more and more businesses. We're, kind, we're always trying to come up with new ways to support small to medium sized businesses and welcome large companies and, and make sure that we have a, um, an, a complete ecosystem of services to support those bilingual workers and their families. But I wonder, Guillaume, um, if as you look to the future, in what ways you see the role of bilingualism in the workforce evolving in the coming years? And it's a very large question, so you can answer it in any way you wish. And are there any emerging trends that you see here or maybe even in other countries? We're talking about bilingualism, English and French here, but you may be aware of other, other countries where it's Spanish and English, uh, but where bilingualism truly is an asset and trends in those, in those countries and within those companies. Thanks for this question. Um, my my perspective is actually twofold. I think a bit stating the obvious, but with machine learning and AI, and everyone can go on chat GPT, do Google Translate, the transactional piece of um, being able to translate French to English in our day-to-day -day will become less and less of an issue. Um, so I think anything that is overly focus on trying to have the transactional right with people that are being able to translate, in my view, um, is maybe not very worthwhile investment over the long run. Because I do think that machine will do a much better job than most of us, actually, they're doing a better job than me already, to be able to translate some of the stuff that I'm thinking in French and English and, um, and uh, the opposite direction. I think where there's going to be a significant competitive edge is for anything that is more strategy related. So when you start thinking about how am I gaining a competitive edge, gaining market share in a certain market where both language are in play, how can I speak to my customer base? How can I react to my competitors? That's where I don't, I have yet to see any good AI that would allow you to be successful there. And being able to engage, connect, understand the nuances is actually, I think, what can make a strategy being executed well or not well. So I think being able to define that strategy and execute it well through those nuances is actually the competitive edge. And that's where I believe that investing in people that are being able to address both languages, but we talk French and English, but to your point, I think it's pretty much true to every places in the world where you don't have one language that is basically at play is absolutely key for businesses to be able to both create value and differentiate themselves from competition. Um, it's very true for us in Quebec. We've got high ambition. It's true for us across Canada as well, but I'm like, we're not unique. I think you could pretty much take any of um, or businesses in Canada and apply the same principle. Thank you, Regis. What about you? What trends do you think we'll see in, um, in terms of leveraging your leveraging bilingual for bilingualism for success? What, uh, what trends do you see and what do you recommend to your, to your clients? Uh, last April, we went to uh, Tunisia because we're looking for a new country and we want to recruit in French. And uh, we just discover and realize that 
there's some uh, partnership already between like Ontario and Collège Boreal and even New Brunswick have school over there that you start from kindergarten, you do the primary, high school, college tuition, all from New Brunswick program. And I think it might be a good trend for the future because you you don't bring the people and you train them afterwards. You'll be like... Uh, Prior to, for, uh, prior to deployment, you'll be able to train them, have them like being able to specify what trade you're looking at. We know that for healthcare here is going to be difficult because of the recognition of the certificate, the process, everything. But if you can train them prior from coming in with all the same education that we have here, that we might have even in Quebec with the French language, I think it can be a, a big solution and uh, not a problem anymore for quite some time. So for future trend, I think it might be one of the good ones. Thank you, Richard. What do you think? Uh, I think the future will bring us an every uh, a multipolar world. Um, if you take the example of French, um, French for time being is spoken by 350 million people worldwide. 40 years down the road, it's going to be 700 million. French today accounts for 20% of the overseas trade. So if you project yourself 20 years down the road, you'll see that more and more you will need to have a second language. And I, I agree with Guillaume, it's not, it's not the technicality. I mean, you could have a very good AI translating. It's the mindset. You have to be agile, you have to be uh, able to adapt yourself to new conditions all the time. So I see the future of French as a global language bright. It's a very bright future. Uh, as long as we do not focus simply on the language issue, but we take it in a holistic way. So welcoming entire families, giving a true path for uh, for business success and for career development for francophone, hence bilingual or multilingual people. Thank you. Well, I think that what it also does is bilingualism gives those people a greater chance at mobility. And so, they have a chance to travel more and bring back their experiences abroad back, back home to us, uh, but also uh, it will challenge their businesses more and they'll get to trade with different business, different companies and see how, how people do things differently around the world. And that's one of the things we saw when we were in Gerba and it's something I saw recently in Quebec City, uh, the chance to trade with other companies and other jurisdictions that speak your, lang your languages uh, just increases uh, the breadth of your possibility. And so I think that that's incredibly exciting. And you talked about the 350 million people today growing to 700 million. You know, for our small bilingual population here in Ontario, that's tremendous opportunity that the rest of the workforce doesn't have at its disposal. Um, and so the opportunity to open it Ontario up to the francophone and bilingual world, uh, I think just brings tremendous economic and cultural potential that um, will just enrich all of us eventually. Do you want to comment on that? Yes, it worked both ways, actually, because we'll attract uh, francophone businesses from the worldwide francophonie, but we'll also help our own businesses to export and go uh, to these markets. And not only there, I mean, um, Guillaume mentioned something re regarding uh, the training of their workforce at Walmart. I have another example, which I, I learned of um, this morning during the, the first panel discussion. Um, Pure Later, uh, American company, wanted to grow the business in Canada. They would establish a call center in New Brunswick because they, they knew they had to be bilingual. So they created like um, 35 or 40 uh, job positions in French for francophones. And then they realized that their call center needed more. So they hired unilingual anglophones to add to this so speaking french is not necessarily i mean you're not necessarily francophone and hence bilingual you could also help by being french help your business grow by hiring more anglophones because you need more people in, in, in the pipeline you need to grow your business so you're helping others to grow their business as well thank you well i just uh, we're almost done uh, so before we go i just wanted to give each one of you a chance to make a final comment what would you like to leave the audience with uh, as we as we wrap up the final panel of the toronto global forum 
I've got the pleasure to start. Um, I think for me, the one thing that is key is it drives, it can drive competitive advantage if it's done the right way. It, I don't think it's something that, you know, is really beneficial if you enforce it. However, if you truly believe that language is intimately linked to culture, to um, behavior, to values, to way to operate, to way to basically um, sometimes think or define stuff, then it is absolutely something that you need a master to be able to drive competitive advantage. So from my business lens and finance lens, I actually think there's a very high return on investment, much higher than one would think. One of the things I really like about what uh, you just said is be all in. The biggest success that we've seen with the client we have is the one that went all in. So give them time on the job to learn the language. Give them time on the job to just be able to adapt and help them. Give them someone. Give them a godfather that is going to be helping him through all the process, through all the paper, through all the agency that he'll have to meet. So it's huge. We want them to change our workforce, our companies, but you have to give them also. So if you go, go all in and just be ready to uh, take care of all the, uh, the, the, the things that surround the worker also around that. We've spoken about French as a language, but of course, that's not the first criterion you apply when you're hiring someone. You're hiring someone because of their hard skills. So French is an added value. It's not the alpha and omega of, of uh, hiring somebody or retaining somebody. But I, I agree with my, my, my colleagues here. Uh, the future is bright for bilingual people and for bilingualism, especially here in, in, uh, in Canada. This is why uh, FGA has been instrumental in implementing the effect, the alliance of francophone organizations, uh, business organization, uh, coast to coast to coast. So with our friends from Quebec, from New Brunswick, from Alberta, and now from British Columbia. So we're not talking minority or majority. We're talking doing business in French, adding French to business. Don't forget that every dollar invested in French economy uh, will trigger down $1.5 down the road. So there's a trickle-down effect, which is great for everyone and for the, the growth of the, of the country as a whole, and not only for the Francophones. Merci. Well, I think it's clear that not only is bilingualism a source of local, provincial, and national pride, but it's also a strategic advantage for, for everyone. But it's one that does require nurturing and investment from all levels of government, uh, but also from different sectors of society. So our business community has to recognize that things might take a little time, but it's worthwhile. And our institutions, our educational institutions, need to partner with uh, those businesses and with each other to try to develop programs to uh, accompagner les, les sociétés, to help um, um, partner with those, with those companies. But language training and making sure that that ecosystem is is part of things that we're working on at the Ontario government, but we're doing it um, in partnership with, with all of the groups represented here today. Um, but it's necessary to ensure that we have the talent for the future. And so I just, uh, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the panelists today for taking time to share their insights with us. We appreciate it very, very much. And thank you to all of you and bonsoir. Thank you.